Hallelujah in this place. Don't stop praising him. Don't stop praising him in this place. You right in line for your blessing. You right where you need to be right now for your blessing. Whatever you've been going through this week, whatever that's been holding you down, we're praising the Lord. The Lord has freed you right now to get your praise on. The Lord has freed you right now to lift your hands and say hallelujah to the Lord. Don't let the devil steal your joy right now. Whatever it is, put it to the side for the next 20 minutes. Whatever it is, put it to the side for the next hour and give him the glory, honor, and praise and do his name. It can't be that bad. It can't be that bad because she just said Jesus will. She just said Jesus will. So wherever it is, he will do it. He will do just that because he said it in his word that he will do it just like that because Jesus will. Jesus will. You don't need nothing else. Say Jesus will. Speak it over your life. Say Jesus will. And it is so. It is so. Because God's word does not come back void. So if he said it, it will be. So go ahead and get your praise on. Go and take the next 20 seconds and just give a praise in this place. Hallelujah, Lord. A big hand praise in this place. Praise him like you already got it. Give him one more hand praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. When I think back over my life and think of what he's already done, he deserves a hallelujah praise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to jump right into the word. I'll, I'll save my pledges for you later. We'll jump, we're jumping right into the word. Numbers. Numbers, the 13th chapter. And I'm, I'm going to jump around here so the, the scriptures will be on the screen if you don't have your Bible. We're going to Numbers, the 13th chapter, starting at the first verse. Numbers 13 and 1. If you don't have your Bibles, it's on the screen. And the Lord said to Moses, send some man to explore the land of Canaan, which I have given to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of his leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. Then we're going to skip down to verse 26. When they came back to Moses and Aaron, the whole Israelite community at Kadesh, in the desert of Paran, they were, there they reported them to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and their cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the sinners of Enoch there. The, the Amorites live in Nabi, the Hittites, Jebutites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea alone in joy. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up, take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the man who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. They spread among the Israelites the bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devoured those living in it. And the people that saw there were great sizes. So the Nephilims there, the descendants of Anna from the Nephilims, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. Now we're going to skip over to the 14th chapter, starting at the 6th verse. Joshua, son of Nun, Caleb's son of Zephon, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is blessed with us, 
if the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only not to re only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So I learned this and I titled my message, Unbalanced Vision. Unbalanced Vision. Let us pray. Most gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this worship that we've had with you, God. Now as we come to this time to bring your word, Lord, we just ask that I be removed, Lord, and you stand here, Lord. Let me be a vessel to your people, Lord. Let every word that proceeds on me um, goes into the people's heart, Lord, and they be able to empower what you have for them today, Lord. We give you the glory and the praise, Lord, because you've already done it in this place, Lord. But we just ask for just a little bit higher in your presence, Lord, to go a little bit further with you, Lord, right now in your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So have you ever been in a situation where it's you and somebody else, and you all saw the same thing but saw different point of views in what you see? You know, you are looking at the same thing, but they see one thing and you see another. I was thinking about, like, those ink blots. You know, so y'all look at this ink block. What, what did y'all see? Y'all can say, you can just throw out some What did y'all see? Two people kissing. What else y'all see? Butterfly. See, that's the ink. See, that's the ink block. See, in therapy and counseling, sometimes they use use the ink blocks, and they would ask people what they see, and they went off of what they see, and they talked about what they mentally was going through. Some people saw bad things; they said they was mentally crazy. Some people saw good things; they would say they're good. But 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 it's the same picture, but different perspectives. Go go, Kylie, go to the next slide. How many y'all remember this? What color is this dress? Ooh, I heard blue, some, some people said gold. Didn't anybody know what color? I mean, this took the internet by storm. Everybody was saying it was this color. Other people were saying it was that color. Nobody could figure out what color it is. I even saw somebody said it was like faded red or something, depending on how you look at it. Everybody was all over the place. But it, but it was about this thing that nobody knew exactly what color it was. No matter what it is, there are plenty of situations where you're going to have a different perspective of what somebody else may have in the same situation. In some cases, that vision can come together and be something great. And other times, those two visions can come together and make, come to destruction. I was thinking about it in families. Like, me and my wife, we, we have our visions for our family. But sometimes I be thinking one thing, and she be thinking another. <laughs> there's sometimes we can come together and make it work. And there's sometimes where that division clashes, and we have to battle until we figure it out. And then, but, but, but it's not for, we're trying to go the same way, but we just have different perspectives on how we get there. Doesn't mean either one of our perspectives are wrong in that situation, but sometimes we have to be able to come together with our, what we see. There are other times when our vision can get cloudy, and we allow fear and anxiety to cloud our vision of what we see. We have to know that God has the clearest vision for our future. And if we, he, sometimes he gives us a glimpse of what we see, but we have to be, live our promises to him to know exactly where we're going. See, God has been doing this all our lives, and he knows exactly where we're going. But we can't allow what we see in front of us hinder for what we already know. We know we serve a God that is bigger than any circumstance, any obstacle, any situation that he has brought us through already through. And if he said he's going to do it, he's going to already do it. God doesn't see problems. We see problems. We see problems. We see issues. We see roadblocks. Only thing God sees is an opportunity, an opportunity for him to show his glory and to show who he truly is. If we don't get anything else out of this sermon today, know that we serve a God that has the clearest vision for what he has for us. And he is omniscient in our lives. God knows what we're going to do to our past, our present, and definitely what's going to happen in our future. So we look at our characters today, and we're looking at the children of Israel. Now, obviously, they have forgot who they were dealing with and who they had been hanging out with for this time period here. So let's get some contents of this story so we can respect the content of what's happening. So like I said, we're talking about the children of Israel. And I, I, I always say after David and Paul, I love reading stories about the children of Israel. Why? Because they remind me the most of our society today. <laughs> the way the children of Israel, sometimes they be flaky, sometimes they all in, sometimes they over here, sometimes they over there. That reminds me, has a lot of similarities to our culture today. And when we find them in the story, they're in the desert of Paran, which is right outside the land of Canaan. And if you don't know what the land of Canaan, that's the promised land that God had promised the people when he was bringing them up out of Egypt. 
right there in verse 1, as we see, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and told the Sydney of spies in the Canaan. Now, this is true in a sense. God did tell Moses to do that, but it wasn't because he just wanted to send spies. This was something that the people actually wanted. If you look over in Deuteronomy 1 and 22, it says this. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land, spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we are to come to. This is the children of Israel speaking to Moses. They went to Moses like, Moses, we need to send some people to spy that land that God told us about. We need to send some people over there because, you know, we want to make sure we know what we know that God already told us. So more or less, God had allowed the Israelites to send spies into the land. I would think, like, this is more of a slap in the face of the guy. Did they not know that God already told them that the land was good? He would already told them that they, that they were going somewhere great. I was thinking, like, did, did they not trust what God was telling them in this moment? And, and, that, and, and isn't it the same God that led them out of Egypt with Pharaoh? Isn't it the lay, same God that showed them the, the miracles and wonders that he brought them out? Isn't it the same God that brought them across the Red Sea on dry land? Isn't it the same God who was in the wilderness with them? He's leading them with a cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. This is the same God. Why would he lead them in a wrong way on a wrong path? But before we jump all over the, the children, we do the same thing. If God tells us to do something, we don't jump in wholeheartedly. Sometimes we'll test the waters just a little bit to see how it is. We won't, we won't go ahead first because we're not sure. We'll question if God really said that or was it somebody, or was that me? Was that me thinking, was that God? Or, or we'll act like we didn't hear God. And sometimes that is how we, how we are. What the Israelites said, we walking by sight, God, and not by faith. And, and they were going to rely on a report of these men to go out and spy that with the promises God had already told them. But I know in my Bible it says we walk by faith and not by sight. And we have to understand if God told us something, it already will be. So God obliged them. He, he, he said, okay, this is what y'all want. I'm going to let this happen. He told them to choose 12 men to go spy the land. One man for every other, one, each one of the 12 tribes. And those men are listed in verse 4 to 15. I was going to read them, but I didn't want to butcher the names in these tribes. So I said, I'm just going to let y'all do that in your own study time. Y'all can go read all the names. <laughs> Now, th now, these men were representation of each one of the tribes. They were like uh, state congressmen, state, state representatives like going to Congress. They represented the people. They, they probably had a postal there. They knew how they felt. They had, knew how the things was. So just their task, they were tasked to go out and spot the land. So Moses had some direction for them. Um, starting right there at the 17th verse, this is what Moses said. Moses went and sent them to explore Canaan. He said, go up through Nabi and on into the hill country. See what the land is like. And whether the people who live there is strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Is, are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some fruit of land. It was the season of the first right. So basically, these men was on a recon mission. And anybody that's been in the military or anything, you know, a recon mission, you go before to check out the land, see where the people is, see you know, how it is, and know what you need to do before you get there. But I was looking at this, and I was questioning some of the things that Moses asked them to report back about. One of the things Moses asked them to say, find out if the land was good or bad. Why is that? I was like, why is that? God had already confirmed to them that the land was good. Did, 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 did the Israelites like did Moses want them to do it for some other reason? I was thinking that Moses tried to get them to get this to help damper their spirits about what they was going into. They had already started talking about, you know, that they weren't sure, so he wanted them to go get the report to come back. Also, God was testing them about their faith. God was trying to see, will they stand strong to what I already told them, or go see what I already know that's there, and will they fall back in what they believe? God had already knew what was in the land, the promised land. He had already scouted it out for them. He already had made sure it was good for them. But they couldn't understand why God would have something so good for them. Sometimes we have to be patient when God is trying to set something up for us. 
We can't get out in front of God and walk in front of him towards something because he hasn't set it all up for us to get there just yet. Sometimes we want to have to stand back and allow God to work and allow it to be good in front of us instead of getting in front of God because we don't know what was there. Because sometimes when we get in front of God, we see things that probably weren't going to be there, but we allowed ourselves to get in front of God. And so it hinders us thinking about should we go there and should we do this because we see something that God didn't even promise us to see. We have to watch how we go out before God and be in front of him. So which already brings me to my first, first point. When we have unbalanced vision, you can't always believe what you hear. You can't always believe what you hear. So, so the spies have gone out, and they come back from this recon mission. they hear, and they got a report for Moses. They came to Moses and the rest of the people, and this is the report they gave. Numbers 13 and 27, it says, They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. It is, it, here's its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We've seen the descendants of Enoch there, the uh, Elamites live in the Bee, the Hittites, the Jebutites, and the Moabites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live in the sea near the Jordan. So I can already picture it. The spies have been gone for 40 days. They roll back into the, the camp. They're in the desert, and they're like, okay, all right, y'all, we got some good news, and we got some bad news. <laughs> we got some good news, and we got some bad news. Okay, what y'all want to hear first? Let's get you good news. The good news is, God was right. It does flow with milk and honey. It's good soil. You'll hear some of the fruit. It's good. But here's the bad news. The bad news is there's some people already there. And these people big. Big, big. They're stronger than us. We look like grasshoppers to these folks. We, we, I don't know. God was tripping. I don't know what he's talking about doing over here. But what we saw is, I don't know, we about to die. <laughs> That's what I know when the spies came back. And anytime you get a report like that, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to be like, eh, I don't know. Oftentimes, we see our path and believe there's no way through that path. Oftentimes, we see it and we start disbelieving and questioning God if this is the way you actually sent me to go. But if God's brought you to this point, he's going to find a way to bring you through that situation. The Israelites would rather trust the report of the spy than trust the promises God had already given to them. I was thinking about this, and I started thinking about customer reviews. I don't know about y'all read customer reviews. I didn't read customer reviews until I met my wife. When I met my wife, she used to do customer reviews, so now I read customer reviews on everything. I mean, every, it, was, it could be a Walmart customer review. It could be anything. I, so, but customer reviews has this good and it's bad. Like, like, we won't go to a movie. We won't go to a restaurant, a new place, if it has custom, bad customer reviews. And, 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 like, you know, you already said, if you read their review and somebody said they had roaches, you ain't not going to that place and eat. Or somebody said they had bad customer service over there, you are not going. I mean, there's this restaurant now we, would, we went to all the time, and we would not go to their restaurant anymore because somebody said they found a her and they food. And we said, nope, we ain't going nowhere just because the one review was bad. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, like, the spies are probably gay. They came back and gave a Google review. They, most of them probably would have gave, like, a two out of five. It would probably been a, one, a bunch of them probably would have said one out of five because the people that were strong. But I was thinking about this, and, and like I said, we think we do customer reviews. Like, we like to travel. We go out of town. We on vacations. And one, one day we was on Facebook in one of these groups, and they were talking about the cruise boats. And, like, people was in a dog in some of these cruise boats that we've been on. And we was like, what? That boat was bad, man. We had a great time on that boat. And people was dog talking about it. It was like old. And, but I came to realize that oh, customer reviews are very, very opinionated. And what they want you to do is believe what they believe. So if you believe what they believe, you can start having the same perspective that they have about certain situations. We have to understand that we have to have our same own perspective of what we see because what, so what somebody else may see may not be the same thing that you may see. You can't always believe what everybody else sees because that ain't for you to see. We have to understand that because sometimes we'll see something else and it damages us where, where, where we're supposed to be going. Because reviews are good and it's bad, but we have to be in our own skin and know exactly what we do. That's like sometimes God will open a door for you to get a new job, but you'll go to that job and see somebody you don't like. So the side of you getting a job, you say, I ain't going to take that job because it's somebody there I don't like. 
or God will be trying to push you into a new ministry. But brother and sister, so-and-so is over that ministry. And you're like, I can't work with them. So I'm just going to be a pew member because I can't work with them. You don't see what God is trying to do. Sometimes you may be telling, God is telling you to go somewhere and you're just too afraid because there's too much work to do over there. It looks like hard over there. So you just decide, I'm just going to stay back and miss my blessing because I don't want to go where God has taught me to go. We have to be aware of what's happening in our lives. We have to be careful of the things that we see, the things that we hear, because it can be going against what God has already told us. He can cause us to backtrack and miss the blessings that store for us in our lives. This is what was happening to the Israelites. Because of this bad report, because of what the spies had said, they had come to the point where they was about to throw in a towel. I mean, they was about to throw in a towel was done. And I mean, it was so bad that they was even talking about going back to Egypt. Going back to Egypt? It's over in the 14th chapter, the first verse. It said this. That night, all the members of the community raised their voice and, and wept out loud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole community said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us out to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They want to go back to Egypt? They want to go back to where they were slaves at? Back to the land that they cried out to God to be freed from? Back to the place they probably was beaten and mistreated? They want to go back. Isn't it hypocrisy how they turned on Moses and Aaron and God? I mean, they was to the point they was ready to impeach Moses and Aaron and find some new leadership. They're like, we need to find somebody that's going to take us back because what's ahead of us is not the way we go. We need to go back. Isn't it crazy how they turned on God so fast because of what they heard and what they, somebody else had saw? Basically, they were saying, God, we know you You did all this stuff for us in the past. You did all this stuff. But, God, this is bigger than you. This, this, this has to be bigger than you. I know, God, I was thinking, like, the Canaanites could not be better than the Egyptians was. The Canaanite army couldn't have been as bad as the Egyptian army or bigger than they was. They couldn't realize that they couldn't believe that God could deliver them from that situation. He could deliver them from this situation. We start with God that's bigger. Let me say, we start with God that's stronger. There's no God like our God. <laughs> so the report of the ten spies took down a whole nation took them down, and that's why we can't, we have to watch what people are saying. We have to watch what we are saying. Proverbs 18 and 21 says, the power, the power has, the tongue has the power of life and death. Their report brought death to the nation. Their report had them thinking death was upon them if they followed themselves and went into the land of Canaan. They could not see past the certain situations and the issue that was right in front of them. This is what we do. When we, this, is, this is how we are. Sometimes when we see people, we'll see a lady at the, at the counter in the grocery store, and she got a bad attitude, and she's just, just not in a good mood. We have a choice. We either meet her with that attitude and go back with her, or we can speak life into her on that day because we don't know what she may be going through in that time. We, I know our kids get on our nerves, and I know this summer – they make my nerves. So, so I know it'd be like that, but we can't go around calling our kids names. We can't call them dumb and stupid and say things about them. We have to actually speak life into our children. I know y'all saying that's what white people do. Yes, maybe we need to get like white people sometimes and just speak life into our children because it's not always about hitting them out of every situation. I know sometimes they're warranted to get hit. I ain't saying don't hit your kid. But there are times when we need to not hit them and talk to them and figure out what's going on with them. I, I, I think about this because in counseling, I get people to come to me all the time. And I, I talk about the kid thing because I have people that come to me and say, when I was a kid, my mama said I was going to be no good. Or I had, I had people telling me, I ain't going to never be nobody. And that sticks inside of you. If you hear that over and over and over again, you really start to think that that's what you're going to be. You're going to be no good. And we have to train people and tell people that you are better than that, that you are not what people tell you. You are bigger than the things that people tell you. We know we are Christians and child of the king. And we know that God said that you are a child of the king. God told us that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. God told us that he would never leave us nor forsake you. 
over in Psalms 20D, David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He making me to lie down in green pastures. He has sought my soul. He lead me through the sands of righteousness for his name. Say, they do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil, but thy rod is with me. Thy God and I said, they comfort me. I just jacked that whole verse up. Forgive me. <laughs> but y'all know what I'm talking about. God is there for you. God is with you always, but you have to know who you are in God. God is there to lead and guide you. Sometimes he would have to correct you, but he's there to fix you in your situation. God will always have your back. But will you have, would you have, you know he'll have your back in every trouble situation that you come to. Some people are going to speak against you. Some people are going to say things about the situation. Some people are going to talk against what you know. But you have to remember and know the promises God has already laid out in your life. That you are a child of the king. And if you are know that he has these promises in your life, it doesn't matter what's in front of you. It doesn't matter what you see because he's going to bring you through all that situation. Amen. So after we stop listening to everything around us, after we stop going through that, we, the way we fix our unbalanced vision, point two is we got to stand strong. We got to stand strong. So we talked, there was 12 spies, right? Ten of them came back with a bad report, but it was two that had a good, that had a good report. These two men were Caleb and Joshua. They would not let the noise and everything that was being said turn them away from what they knew was already true. Over in Numbers 14 and 6, right there, the six verses say, Joshua, son of Nun, Caleb, son of Jephon, who were among these who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire assembly, Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Now, these two men stood strong on the promises they already God had given them. They did not want to turn back and go the opposite way. They wanted to continue to move forward. We cannot always follow men because we don't know where men is leading us to in certain situations. Ladies, if your husband or your boyfriend is not being led by the father, I'm telling you, jump out the boat now. <laughs> jump out the boat, swim to shore, because you're being led into a storm. And when you go into that storm, you don't have any protection or any covering on you. So your boat's going to get wet, and it may start to sink. Fellas, I ain't let you out. Fellas, we have to stay in line with the Father. We have to stay connected to him. The Bible tells us to trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to our own understanding. And all our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our path. We still have to stay connected with the Father, fellas, because we have to know where God is leading us. Because if we get out of line where he's leading us, we lose that protection and covering that's over our lives. When we start to get out of will of God, we lose that protection. God said he will never leave us nor forsake us, and he won't. God is leading us through the valley, and if we get, like I said earlier, we get in front of God in the valley. If you don't know, the valley is dark, and you can't see. But if you have the light that is in front of you leading you, you won't bump into some things that you might have bumped into when you get in front of the light. Because of the light behind me, how am I supposed to see in front of me? Because the light comes in front of me, then I have a clear pathway to my feet. So I know God is in front of me, and I want God to be in front of me in every situation that I go through. Now, Caleb and Joshua had a firsthand account. They was one of the spies that went over there, and they didn't allow the negative stuff that they saw to deter them from what they knew God's promise was. So they decided to stand up and speak about it. They mean, and this had to take a lot of courage to stand up and speak. I mean, the crowd at this point was growing restless. Like I said, they were trying to get Moses and Aaron out, and, and they knew the current situation, but they still stood up and were strong about what they knew. Caleb and Joshua knew something that, that the people, they had something that the people in Canaan didn't have. They had God on their side. They knew the victory was already theirs because God had already said it. Yeah. See, the real enemy was not the people of Canaan. It was the people's own discontent. <laughs> See, they were already on the, losing their lack of faith in this situation. 
They couldn't see past their issues in there. And I was thinking about that because when we have little faith, little things happen in our lives. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about those disciples. When, they, when, when the man brought their child, and they, were, and they were asked the disciples to cast out the demon, but they weren't able to do it. And then Jesus came, and he did it. He said, they asked Jesus, why weren't we able to do it? He said, because you had little faith. And little faith yields little results. When we have big faith in our God, big faith in what we already know, we're able to move mountains out the way. When we have big faith, we're able to walk through the wall and not around the wall. When we have big faith in God, he knows exactly what he's going to do. But we have to believe and trust in him and already have our faith led in his way. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about Steph Curry. Steph Curry, y'all don't know, NBA Steph Curry um, is one of the greatest shooters in the game. Steph Curry... Go ahead, Kelly, you can play. Steph Curry has two NBA MVPs. He has four NBA championships, one finals MVP, and he's the all-time leader in three-point shooting. Yeah. Now, Steph Curry, when he was in high school, he was 5'8", 150 pounds. I was looking at the stats. He, currently, he's 6'2", 185 pounds. That means since high school, he's put on seven inches and 35 pounds. <laughs> seven inches and 35 pounds. That means he did not get big, big between high school and now. And I was looking at, and his scouting report, they said, Steph's explosiveness and athleticism is below average. And that you can never rely on him to run a team. This is what they said about Steph when he was younger. And I was looking at that, and they, they got this new documentary out about him, and he was, they was interviewing Steph, and they said, Steph, what was it about? Steph said, I knew that everybody was bigger than me on the court. I knew that I was the, one of the smallest people on here, but I knew one thing that I could shoot the ball. <laughs> there was one thing I knew I could do, I could shoot the ball, and he has unlimited range to be able to shoot the ball. And I was thinking about basketball, that's what's important. You can be the biggest dude on the court, but if you can't put the ball in the basket, your ability is very limited to what you'd be able to do. Steph Curry stood on exactly what he knew he could do, and that was shoot the ball. And being able to shoot the ball made him one of the greatest shooters in the NBA. Being able to shoot the ball is why he is a four-time NBA championship. He stood on what he already knew, the God-given ability that was given to him was able to shoot the basketball. That's what we have to do. We have to stand on the abilities God has already given us. Whatever God has put in your heart to be able to do, whatever ability that you have, then you have to stand on that because that ability is what's going to get you through. That ability is what's going to get you over the mountaintop. That ability is going to make you great because God is already standing with us and we have to stand in the midst of the chaos and everything that happened around us. If Steph Curry would have listened to his scouting report, he wouldn't be in the NBA today. If Steph Curry would have listened to the naysayers and the people around him, if Steph Curry would have looked at the people on the court and said, I can't do this, he wouldn't be the greatest shooter to ever shoot in the NBA today. So we have to stand strong in knowing that we don't. We have to be like that tree blended by the water. We may sway, we may bend, but we'll never be moved in our situation. We have to stand strong for what, all the promises that God has already had in our lives. <laughs> we have to stand strong because God's ability to bring us through a situation is not always the way, we, way it looks like or not always the way we want it to look like. God deserve, reserves the right to bring us through the situation however, however he sees fit to get the glory. We forgot it's not about us. I'm going to say it again. It's not about us. It's all about what God has in store. Kyle, you can stop it. Yes, God could have brought them to the promised land. He could have easily brought them to, up to Canaan and, and nobody been there. It could have been nobody there. He could have easily did that, but that's not. Because I'm sure if he had did it that way, the Israelites would have found a way to say it was them who did it and not God. They would have took, they would have took credit for it. They would have been like, yeah, we walked in here. We did this. Yeah, they, you know, even though God was there, they would have been them doing it. And that's how we are sometimes. We, we, we get in situations that we say it happened really, really easy. And we was like, oh, that was all my ability. That was that was my good work. That was, that was the things I had. And we don't give God the glory and God and praise that he already has did it for us. He made, he made ways over mountains and storms. God brought us through every situation. And we have to have genuine faith in him and not situational faith. Mm. Situational faith is saying he can do this thing, but I don't know about this one over here. 
He, he, can, he can pay my bill, but he can't heal cancer. Or he, he, can, he can do this, but he can't do that. We can't have situational faith. We have the faith on every situation that comes in our life that God is going to do it for us. What we just say, Jesus will? <laughs> Jesus will. We won't always see how God is doing things in our lives. Just because we don't see it does not mean God is not working in the, in the wind. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, now faith is the confidence of what we hope for, the assurance of what we do not see. God is always working in our lives. Whether we see a problem or not, God is getting the opportunity and the glory out of it. We have to stand strong in knowing that God is working. God is in behind closed doors doing things that we can't even see. And we have to trust and believe and thank God for doing these things for us. Caleb and Joshua stood strong to the people and pleaded for them to change their minds about the situation. The people threatened their lives because of what they said. The people talked about stoning Caleb and Jacob because of this. Over there in the 14th to 10, it says, but the assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the Israelites. As soon, as soon as the people talked about hurting God and Hurting, no, hurting Caleb and jo Joshua, God appeared. He showed up right on time. Whenever you are doing what you're supposed to do for God, whenever you're standing in the gap for him, you are always under his protection. When you stand faithful, when you stay connected to him, he will, you have special protection that's all around you. And no man will be able to harm you or come against you anytime. He does not play about his children that's standing in the gap for him. And if you're standing in the gap for you, he will stand in the gap for you. So we do not have to fear and stand strong when we're about the Father because he's always there to protect us. Amen? Amen? Which brings me to my final point here. When we have unbalanced vision, we can either get God's blessings or God's punishment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at this point, at this point, I, I believe God was fed up with the Israelites. He's fed up with their behavior, their blatant disrespect of their faith. I think God was just angry and frustrated with them. Numbers 14 and 11 said, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contemption? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the things I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a great nation and stronger than they. At this point, the Israelites had experienced God's power and his goodness and all the signs which he had performed, performed for them, which you would think would make them undoubtedly trust him and follow him at this point. But in some reason, the more God had done for them, the greater the frustration I believe God had for them distrusting him. God wasn't even, it was so bad, God didn't even go speak to the Israelites. He went and spoke to Moses. He pulled Moses to the side, like, I got to have a talk to you. We got to have a meeting. <laughs> I, I, I believe this is so because he, he didn't want to speak to them because I don't believe the Israelites would have even heard God's voice at that point. <laughs> I think they were so far gone that they wouldn't even recognize that God was even speaking to them. <laughs> we cannot allow and get caught up in our situation so deep that we can't hear God's voice. <laughs> God is always speaking to us, but if we get so far away from him and get so far away from the spirit, we can't hear him through the chaos. <laughs> we have to find time in our daily lives to always get close to God. I know life has a lot. There's a lot of violence out here, negativity, stresses around every corner, but we have to make time to get closer to the Father. We have to get closer to that peace that he is. We have to get closer to that joy that he is. We have to get closer to that all in all because he is the best remedy to this chaos in this world. Sometimes we have to turn off the, the, the rap music and put on some gospel music when we're driving in our car. We got to look at our daily devotionals and get some spirit in us. We may have to check out a scripture or two throughout the day because life is hard. Or they say life be life in, and we, we, we have to get some the God in our spirit. We have to get some Holy Ghost in our spirit and some goodness in our spirit because the world is evil and the world is chaotic. And if we don't stay close to the Father, we can get caught up in all the mess in our lives. I love this about Moses. I love this. It, Moses was the intercessor for the people. And God was to the point that he was about to wipe the Israelites out, the Israelites out from the earth and start over with a brand new group of people. 
Now, I was curious about this. I was like, man, you're going to take them out and start over? Like, what would that look like? Like, literally, how is he going to start over? Was he just going to do, like, the Adam thing and build some people up off the ground and start over that way? Was he going to find someone? I don't know. That was just a curiosity to me. Was like, and he said they weren't going to be just any old people. They were going to be greater and stronger than the Israelites already were. I was, part of me was like, what's you going to do it? Because I was seeing how they did it, but that's not God. That's not, that way, he, God wouldn't allow his word to come back and boy. He told him he would deliver the children of Israel to the promised land. He kept his promise. He had, he had Moses stand in the gap. Moses stood in the gap just like Jesus stood in the gap for us. <laughs> Moses stood as a buffer between God and the children. It was Moses who pleaded to God to spare their lives. God, Moses knew that he can appeal to the character of God, and he knew the type of God that they were dealing with. Over in Numbers 14 and 18, he said, God is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sins and rebellion. The goodness of God's nature in general is that he is long-suffering. He is slow to anger. He has great mercy, and he's not provoked. He's, but he's tender and compassionate towards his offenders. God's readiness in particular is to pardon our sins, and he forgives us of our iniquities and transgressions, sins of all kinds. Isn't it great that we serve a God that forgives us for the mess that we do? Isn't it great that we serve a God that when we turned our back on him, when we did something that we wasn't supposed to do, maybe yesterday or this morning, that God forgives us in those situations. God doesn't hold it over our head like men may do. God doesn't go turn back in three weeks from labor. Remember when you did this to me? God doesn't do that to us. God will pardon us of our sins. God will give it to, and take it to, away from us. Chain the devil, chain... Ah. Tell the truth and say it, though. Thank you, Tatiana. That God is a good God and that he's always good to us. Amen. Yet even though with forgiveness from God and his mercy, there comes judgment to the people. God decided not to wipe the Israel out, Israelites out from the face of the earth, but the sins of the people could not go unpunished. God said that those that had grown to man's status would die in the wilderness. They didn't die all at once with no big plague, but they died over time. The people wished that they might die in the wilderness. Y'all remember early in the chapter, they said, they, why did God bring us to the die? So God granted this passionate wish of theirs, and he made their sins their ruin. He entrapped them in the words of their mouths and caused their tongues to be their falling point. He took their words, and it, their words became their grave in the wilderness. Remember earlier we talked about you have to watch what you're saying over your life. You have to watch what you're saying because that one thing that you're saying could be the exact thing that be your grave in your life. You have to quit saying I'm broke because if you keep saying that you're broke in your life, your bank account will keep looking broke. You have to stop saying that you're sick and that you don't feel good because every time you say that, your body will start to think that way and continue to be sick. You have to speak wellness over your life. You have to speak good things over your life because that's the way you stay above the things that's happening to you. Like I said, we have to watch what we say. We have to watch what we're saying on our lives. These things that the Israelites were saying ended up being their grave and cost them from getting into the promised land. They had to turn back and go towards the Red Sea. Their punishment was 40 years, 40 years for breaking a covenant relationship with God. 40 years they groaned under the burdens of their own sin. See, our sins don't go unpunished by God. We may think they do, but they don't. When we sin, we may be blocking a blessing that was in store for us at that time. When we are sinning, we may be slowing down something that may have came to us faster, but we had to sin to get in our way. We have to avoid the sin in our life and get that out of the way because we're blocking God's vision of what he has. Remember I said God is always working in the background, but when we are not in his will and not doing what he's doing, he may close the door that he might have been about to open for you. He may put somebody that might have walked in your way. He may take them away and not give them the blessing that you have because you're not in line with what God has for your life. But the beautiful thing is there's God's punishment and then there's God's blessing. Yet when we stand with God and stay attached to his, his blessings and his promises are always there to follow. Over in Numbers 14 and 24, it says this, But because my servant Caleb had a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. 
if you recall, Caleb and Joshua were the ones, the two spies that spoke good about the land. They spoke against what the rest of the Israelites were talking about. Their unwavering faithfulness to God brought them to this point that they didn't receive the same punishment that the Israelites faced. Mm -hmm. We must follow God wholeheartedly. We must follow God and fully obey his will. And the only way we do this, we have to have a different spirit than everybody else. Mm -hmm. We can't have the same spirit that the world has. It said that we're supposed to be in the world, not of the world. Mm -hmm. We have to have a, we can't have the same mindset of the people because if we have the same mindset of them, we will perish just with them. Mm -hmm. We have to have a heavenly mindset and a heavenly spirit because when we walk, because we are peculiar people, we're different. We can't walk the same as they do. We can't act the same as they do. We have to do, go and about it in a different way. 1 Corinthians 2 and 12 says, what we, have, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given up. We can't understand God if we have the spirit of the world. This spirit allowed us, the spirit that we have allowed us to follow God in times of desperate, desperate times. The spirit that we have allows us to honor God even when our back up against the wall. I love it here because the beautiful part was it wasn't just Caleb and Joshua that would be blessed by them staying faithful to God. Their descendants will be, will be blessed also. Their children, children will be blessed also. So there's blessing in doing what God says because it won't be just you to get blessed, but the people around you will be blessed too. You don't want your blessing. It may not be just for you, but it's somebody, your neighbor may be being blessed in this situation. Your church member may be being blessed in this situation. Your, somebody that's around you may be blessed if you stay faithful to the commitment to what God has for you. We must see that bl the blessed people are, are followed by God because it's not only for our benefit but for the total benefit of God. We must hold unto God's unchanging hand. God is, not, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It is for us to be intentional about staying committed to God. Even when, when our backs up against the wall, even when our vision isn't clear about what's going on, we have to stay committed to the Father. It is those times that God honors us the most. When we're in a situation where it doesn't look good and we stay connected to the Father, God honors those situations. When our backs up against the wall, when we don't know where to turn, we don't do like the world do and turn to other situations. We turn our faith straight up to God. We turn our attention to Him and have faith in His Word because he's already promised that he would do it and he would bestow those things on our lives. I love it. If in that 1 Corinthians 2 and, 2 and 9 it says, but it is written that eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those he loved. If the Israelites would have stayed the course, if the Israelites would have stayed in line with God, they would have seen the glory of God in his fullest in, in the promised land. They would have seen God not punish them for 40 years to stay in the wilderness, but they would have seen God defeat the people that was in front of us. God is telling us today that we have to stay the court. Do not waver in what's going on for you. I know you're right there at the cuff of the promised land. I know you're right there about to enter in where he has for you. You cannot listen to the report of the people. You cannot listen to what's going on around you. You know that God has promised these things in your life. Even though you see roadblock after roadblock, even though you see obstacle after obstacle, even though your money may feel low, even though the education may not be there, God said, I will do it so it may be so. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard, nor has the end into the heart of man what I'm going to do for you. So you haven't even seen what God's about to do for you. He ain't even told you what he's about to do to you. It ain't even entered into your spirit what God is going to do for your life because he has something special planned for you. You just have to stay the course. You have to stay in line with what he's already told you to do. God is working it out, but you have to be ready for, for it to be worked out. We have to know that God is working on our, in our good. He's working in our favor. Your eyes haven't seen it because he hasn't put it there for you to see yet. Your ears haven't heard it because he's not ready to tell you what he's about to do for your life. Your heart hasn't felt it because he's already doing it and he's not ready for you to feel it. But you have to know that it's happening in your life. You you have to know that it's there, but you have to stay patient and ready for that. I know this is true because a long time ago, the Jews yelled out, crucify him. They yelled, crucify him. See, what they thought this was going to be a normal crucifixion of a normal man. 
Because when Jesus got crucified, that was not the first time a man had been crucified. Then it was happening a long time before that. They didn't understand that when they crucified Jesus, that God was going to get the glory out of the situation. They didn't know when they put my Jesus up on a cross and they put nails in his hands and nails in his feet that they thought it was going to be over. They didn't know when they put a crown of thorns in their hand and spirits in his side, they thought it was going to be over. The beautiful thing is Jesus wasn't just up there just hanging up there. He was doing the work of God the whole time. He was telling God, forgive them for they know not what they do. He said, God bless them. He healed. He, he brought the thief that was on the cross with him into the promised land. He told Mary that you were going to be okay. He was still in a time of struggle. Even in the time of despair, God was still doing, Jesus was still doing his work. So even when we're in situations that look bad, even when we're in situations that are not favorable for us, we have to still be about God's work. We have to still be about what he has to do. Because you know why? Because Jesus died on that cross. He hung his head and died. But you remember this, that he stayed there all night Friday night. He, they thought it was over because they didn't see him. He stayed there all day Saturday. They still didn't see him, so they thought they had him. He stayed there all night Saturday night, and they were feeling good about the situation. But early on Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand, defeating death in the grave. So what does that tell you? That even though you're looking bad, even though situations don't seem favorable for you, even though things don't look right, stay the course. Because this next time, morning's going to come when your glory and your power of God is going to step in in your life. And when the power of God comes in, everything has to change. Because when Jesus Jesus got up out of the grave. He took all the sins of the world off of him. When Jesus got up out of the grave, there was no more. We, we broke the covenant, the curse that we had upon us. When Jesus got out of the grave, power and glory and the devil was defeated in that situation. So know when your day comes and you, you, you serve a God that's a resurrection God, that with everything that seems dead in your life, when things don't seem right in your life, God is able to bring it back to life. God has been able to resurrect that situation and make it better than it was before. When Jesus got up, he got up like nothing ever happened. Jesus got up and he's sitting at the Father. He walked around earth and talked to people after it was over. Jesus walked around, he was eating fish and forgiving people. Jesus knew that it wasn't over when he went to the cross, that that was just the beginning. That was just a new chapter in his life. That was just the next step that he had to go through for you and for me. So know that this situation that you're going through is only a test. Know this situation is only a season in your life. Know that this will turn around in your, for your good at some point. And would you have to stay connected with the Father? Jesus knew that G God was always with him. Even though God had stepped back for a second because he knew what Jesus had to go through, he had never left his side. He had never leave him nor forsake him. So even though it feels like God is not close, even though it feels like God is not there, he is right there with you. He needs you to go through the fire. He needs you to go through the situation because if he pull you out too soon, you won't be what he needs you to be. So sometimes he got to leave you in the fire just a little bit longer. He got to leave you in there just a little bit while because when he pull you out there at the right time, you're going to be better than you was before. You're going to be fully cooked on the inside. Your spirit's going to be high. Your faith is going to be overwhelming. And you're going to be good to this situation. And he's going to take you to places that you never thought you'd see. Eyes have not seen, ears not have not heard, but has entered in the heart of man what God's going to do for you if you continue to love him and you continue to stay faithful to him. Give God a hand praise in this place. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Give him that praise that you already know is done in your life. You may not see it, but it's already happening in your life. You may not know where you're going, but it's already happening in your life. Keep God first. Keep him walking in front of you. And I love this. The beautiful thing about this, the, the Israelites had a relationship with the Father. They had a relationship. They knew him. And then they turned, they, they, they did things wrong, but they knew who God was. We have to have a relationship with the Father. If you don't have a relationship with the Father today, get one on today. It's not going to be easy. I'm going to say it again. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be rough times in this relationship. But one thing that you can stand on is God is that we're going to leave you nor forsake you. He's always going to be there with you. And he's always going to be taking care of the ones that love him. Falling in love with Jesus was the best thing that I ever did, because my love to him is reciprocated back. 
it's the blessings the, when I worship him, when I give him, I know that there's a blessing on the way. And I don't do it just for the blessing that's coming. I do it because I love him. Because what he did on the cross is just enough for me to give him glory, honor, and praise every day. Every day. If he doesn't like the sun, if he doesn't do anything else, he's already done enough. That is so true. That is so true. God has done so much for us. I, I, I th when I talk about other people, people, they come to my office, they be talking about, well, I, I had this bad day, I had this bad day, and if I see them like every two weeks, I'm like, so you had three bad days? Yeah, that's about right. So you mean you had 11 good days? 11 good days for three bad days. Someone says, my good days outweigh my bad days, so I won't complain. Didn't say there wasn't going to be hard. Didn't say the road wasn't going to be rough. Didn't say every day was going to be peachy. But your good days always going to outlaw your bad days. We can't complain about those bad days. Because those bad days is what's going to build your faith up when the times get really hard. <laughs> When times get really rough, when times are not good, and you don't, and you may have little faith, you can go back and grab those bad days when he still was blessing you in the middle of that, when he still was giving you what you need. And we just want to thank God for it, because when we have unbalanced vision, when we don't see what God, God is always working it out for our good. Give God a hand praise in this place. <laughs> Hallelujah.